listening to Clarity on Fire, a podcast for people who know what they don't want out of their life and career, but aren't sure what they'd rather be doing. In a world where it's easy to exist, but hard to feel alive, we, Kristen and Rachel, two certified life and career coaches, are here to help you cut through the information overload, get unstuck, and focus not just on how you can have a career you're passionate about, but how to create a whole life that feels fulfilling. So join us here, where we serve up inspiration and down-to-earth wisdom in a way that only two best friends can. We want you to experience the relief of knowing that, yes, you're allowed to want more out of your life and career. And no, you don't have to wander through the dark anymore. Our job is to light the fire that shows you the way. Let's go. Um, Kristen just suggested that we should have changed into our podcasting pants to do this. <laughs> Sometimes podcasting in jeans, you know, we're, we're going to get comfy or it's too hard. It's, eh? uh, last time my leg completely fell asleep. I'm like, I need particular. <laughs> I'm thinking of those like um, Buddha pants. Is that what they're called? The, like the oh, yeah. really mm-hmm. flowy, pillowy. Yeah. Maybe we just need a, a pair of podcasting pants each. <laughs> Um, I mean, typically yoga pants do for us, but we're both wearing jeans right now. And we were both like, oh, the idea of this. (laughs) (laughs) Well, just Mm. keeping it classy (laughs) and sexy and real. (laughs) Um, yeah. Mm. So, um, well, I don't know. I could probably create a segue about that. Podcasting pants into into what we're getting into today. (laughs) Good luck. (laughs) Well, this is a side chat. And to be perfectly frank with you, we we didn't really know what we were going to talk about until very recently, because it turns out we both had a sort of similar-ish idea. But I'm going to just tell you right now, that's where it ends. It's (laughs) it's kind of similar. It is vague. I think there will be a point by the end of this. I yeah, I feel like both of our ideas go under the same umbrella so that's fine we'll talk about the umbrella and we'll okay we'll get into whatever whatever happens this was the point of side chats originally it was turn the microphone on have a vague idea i just start talking a subject and go because why why would you like why would you want to listen to people just riff about something because the idea was that it kind of sounds like how Kristen and i sound when we talk to each other without a microphone. These, it were, just is like, these were meant to be as if you were a sitting down to lunch with us. And oh, sure, sure. where do our conversations go when we're right. just the two of us going into some random yeah. thought or idea or... Right. Sitting down to lunch is better than being a fly. Got you. <laughs> yeah. You can sit down to lunch. You don't have to be a, a, a different on species. <laughs> um, so yeah, we have that... other... I mean, we have book club episodes where we actually have outlines and we sure. get into particular points we want to make or we have expert interviews but this one's just let's just dive in and see where it goes it's about the journey not the destination (laughs) how coachy of you (laughs) i'm sorry (laughs) um okay so i guess i'll start with an anecdote which is that when we um when we ran we maybe we let's add this to our agenda for our meeting today we should talk about like should we ever run our getting over people pleasing course again it's been like two years i have a we lot of clients do it. going through it right now even though it's yeah. two years old so maybe we should do it i i think our people tend to be people pleasers and a i'll lot. take part of that responsibility because yeah. like attracts like okay Put a pin in that, and we'll talk about potentially bringing back getting over people pleasing some point. We have a later leader, this we year have a leadership meeting uh, every Wednesday, and it's she happening. says it like it's a joke because it kind of is. <laughs> I mean, it feels it like it sounds one. more formal than it is. Uh, but yeah, we'll add it to our agenda to our leadership meeting today. Um, and if you really love, leading? God knows, <laughs> if you really love this idea, as we're talking out loud with the microphone on. Uh, leave a comment. Be like, please, I would love yeah. to do your people pleasing course because that will motivate us to actually open do it. it back up for you guys. Yeah. Okay. So when we ran our people pleasing course, it's been over two years ago now. Or not close quite. To two Almost years. two years. Yeah. Um, we gave people the assignment. Okay. So 
as some of you probably can relate to, (laughs) when you are a people pleaser, this applies to anyone, but especially if you feel like you're a people pleaser, there is so much discomfort in things that are kind of easy for other people or that they feel kind of mundane confrontation, just having an opinion, expressing a difference, speaking up, disagreeing. Yeah. I mean, just, just holding your ground. Mm -hmm. And so one of the homework assignments we give people is to practice discomfort. And the best way to do that, or one of the ways that we've told people to do that is physically, like literally do a plank, a a real plank and hold it for, I don't know, a minute or something. I don't even think I could hold a plank for a minute. I'm just going to be real, real with you. (laughs) Um, Or like a wall sit or something. Or chair pose in yoga with no wall. With no wall Mm -hmm. and hold it and like observe what happens. For me, it's shaky. Oh God, I hate that pose. I hate any abdominal exercise. (laughs) Really just lots of exercise I'm not a fan of. (laughs) I, but I think that it's helpful to bridge the gap between mind and body to see that when you're, when you get physically uncomfortable and you start to get shaky, you know, it's actually good for you. When you're holding that plank, you know, that it's because it's good for you and that you're building up, you know, you're tearing things down and you're breaking things down, but then you're building them back up. And there's sort of a certain level of physical discomfort that we're habituated to that we know is stretching us and it's getting us out of our comfort zone and it's good for us. But we don't have that same paradigm for emotional discomfort. And when you're a people pleaser or when you're a perfectionist, which is honestly just a different form of people pleasing, Mm -hmm. um, or when you're just afraid of vulnerability, which is pretty much something every people pleaser is afraid of, then you don't really have a strong, you don't usually have a strong sense of like emotional tolerance. Like you can't tolerate emotional discomfort almost at all. It's like, it's literally like your, your, your legs and butt have atrophied. (laughs) Like you haven't gotten up off the couch in three years and you can't hardly walk and you can't do a squat because you are so like the littlest little squat would make you shaky and would make you break out into sweat. Some of y'all are that emotionally speaking, and you have like almost no tolerance for emotional discomfort. And so we give people the homework of literally practicing physical discomfort as, as a way for you to connect the dots between, Oh, this is how it should feel when I'm making progress. Like discomfort is not a bad thing. And if I can breathe through the discomfort of this, then I can also, there's nothing wrong with the fact that I'm feeling emotional discomfort. And I can also breathe through the discomfort of that. Mm-hmm. I, I like this for a lot of reasons. First, I do think we have a different concept of physical discomfort. And whether it's something that you're doing to put yourself in a physically uncomfortable situation, which if you ask me, is all exercise. I mean, that's for the most part, unless you're just like walking and it feels nice. I mean, like mild exercise. If we're talking about aerobic exercise, rigorous exercise, strenuous, like muscle building, endurance building exercise. So the type that I tend to avoid if, if I'm, if I I can, (laughs) yeah. Or sometimes it's physical discomfort that you didn't, you didn't choose. Maybe you got sick. Maybe you got a cold. Maybe you got COVID. Um, Maybe you got COVID. Maybe you have allergies this time of year. And your body is physically uncomfortable to be in for a little while. But regardless of whether you put yourself into that situation or it happened to you, we have a better concept of the fact that that's temporary. We know the workout will end. We know the cold will pass. We know if we're tired, eventually we'll sleep again. When it's emotional, it sometimes feels more intangible. And so we can get more stuck and fearful of emotional pain because it's not so clear cut as this plank will be over in one minute. Yes. And so it's harder, it's harder to ask yourself to start there with building resilience. I'm not saying it's impossible, but I'm saying resilience is resilience. And when you have practiced it in a physical sense, 
it's easier to translate. Yes. And it's like, I know I can do hard things. I know I can be in uncomfortable situations and that they will end and that they will pass and that I'm actually getting stronger. Yeah. Even using the sick example, I heard, um, I don't know if this is scientifically true or not, but I like, I like thinking of it this way. Instead of saying I'm sick, um, you could say I'm healing because the truth is you already got sick. All the feelings that you're having now is your body fighting to get well. Yeah. So even that is you getting stronger, mm-hmm. even though it feels like you're at the effect of it, it's your body and yeah. your immune system working hard and healing you and getting stronger. Absolutely. And on the other side, you will be more resilient. So totally. even that counts. Um, so when you think of it that way, it's easier to conceptualize. And then you can translate that into, if I can do hard things in this capacity, I can also speak up at my work meeting. And the same thing is going to be true. I'm going to have some physical sensations because what else is fear except really a a set of physical sensations that we don't like. It's maybe your, your brain getting a little cloudy and you kind of lose what you're going to say. It's having tension in your shoulders. It's having a pit in your stomach. That's what we don't like. We don't like the physical sensations of fear and anxiety. Yeah. And it doesn't last much longer than any plank. That's the thing is that when you avoid a difficult emotion or when you're afraid of a confrontation or something, typically the it takes, and again, this is also something that I have read and I don't know is scientific fact, but like, did you come here for scientific facts? <laughs> Yeah, like Google, if, if you want to fact check me, you're welcome to, but the average emotion doesn't last much more than 90 seconds. Mm-hmm. There is some science behind that. I but think I, there I is. I swear to it. So if that's what you're spending years of, avo- truly, there are some people who are spending years avoiding a 90 second emotion. Mm-hmm. Like the worst of it is going to peak in about 90 seconds. Because you can't actually hold a difficult emotion for that long, but you can avoid it for that long and you can create and a lot longer. Yeah. And then you can create all of this tension in your body and all of this fear, chronic ailments. Some of you, some of y'all need to get much better at externalizing your discomfort so that you're not internalizing all of it and making yourself sick, which Mm -hmm. I have coached so many people who would literally rather, as the saying goes, when you avoid a war outside your, of yourself, you create one within yourself. You'd rather be sick than create any sort of tension on the outside. Now, there was a scientific study that I quoted in a blog that I wrote, I don't even know how many years ago. Uh, and I, I don't, I, you can go find it. We can link to it if you want to. Um, but the core of it was, they did a a psychological experiment where they would ask people to sit with their thoughts for a certain amount of time or receive receive an electric shock. Yeah, I remember that. And the majority of people would rather receive an electric shock up to a certain point, like a pretty high dose of an electric shock rather than sit with their own thoughts. And that's that's pretty telling. That's not even confronting another person. Exactly. So some exactly. of you are are like, I'd rather die. Oh. I'd rather get electrocuted. <laughs> and just great. It's... And and does that sound healthy to you guys? No, I know, I know it doesn't, but I know that so many people genuinely break out in sweat at the idea of telling another person what they really think or just disagreeing with your mom about something. Mm-hmm. I, and asking a question in a work meeting. <laughs> having a disagreement or having a sharing a different opinion. Those can be, they can make you sweat. They can make your heart race. They can make you feel like you're doing a blank, frankly. Right. And it's really uncomfortable. And so if you want to get better at sitting in discomfort so that you can grow, because that's the point. So that those situations aren't quite so scary, but maybe you're not quite ready to Speak up in that speak up in that meeting or disagree with your mom. Start with doing a plank, but with the intention of I'm this not doing what this it will to feel get like, abs. Right. I'm doing this 
to experience discomfort on purpose and right. realize I'm okay. I can do hard things. I can do uncomfortable things. I can breathe through discomfort. I mean, I should do that while I'm, I should do planks, but just to do planks. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Cause I can do, I can do everything else, but I should do that to be like, but I can do hard. I can do hard. Th- I just don't want to. <laughs> well, it's a whole nother conversation. That's a whole other thing. But there is, I, I do think, I mean, it, it, it relevant in that. I do think a lot of times we don't consider how our minds and our thoughts and our mood is affected by our bodies and vice versa. I, I think we are in our minds or we're in our bodies. Actually, we're mostly just in our minds. It's like, who's and, in their body? <laughs> maybe when you're exercising, because you have to be. Uh, but on the whole, I think we're really bad at integrating them. At bridging the gap? Yes. I know I am. That's every single time I I talk to our tarot reader or uh, I get any kind of f- feedback from an intuitive or anything like that. It's always get more embodied, be in your body. You're up in your head all of the time. And we forget that we're physical humans having like a human experience. <laughs> and that's where change happens. We can't just be in our head thinking about things all the time. We have to be able to do the thing yeah. we want to do to make the progress. And sometimes that is as simple as asking for what you want or speaking up or taking that first action step that you're terrified of to start your business or whatever your goal is. But otherwise your, your fear, the internal fear can feel more paralyzing than the external physical consequence. And you'll shut yourself down. So we're saying like, let's start with the body. Instead of thinking you have to change your mindset, which I think is where a lot of people think they have to start. Let's start with the body. Let's try that whole new approach. Yeah, you can reverse engineer your way into doing hard things is I think the point here. Um, but I also have other ideas because I think this goes beyond just bridging the mind body gap. It's like, how do we, how do we take things that are kind of intangible, like emotional discomfort, very intangible? How do we make it more tangible so that we understand it? We have more of a context for it. So that's why I'm like, do a wall sit, do a plank, because it's it's one of the better sort of stand-ins. Like it's like a physical representation of what it actually feels like. And it lasts about the same length of time mm-hmm. too. So I kind of want to talk about how else we can make things that are intangible and that we have a hard time grasping into something more physical so that we understand them better and so that we have better context for them. So I have another idea that's totally not related to the body necessarily in any way, but it is more tangible, which is, okay, let's say you like the idea of developing a more robust relationship with the universe. Like you want signs, but you're, you're asking maybe for a sign and you don't really feel like you're getting one. And it's just, you're up in your head about it. One of the things I like to do is I like to whip my phone out and I'll close my eyes and I'll open like up, you know, my playlist or, you know, my music library. And I'll just, scroll with my eyes closed, scroll, 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 scroll until my thumb lands on something, or I just feel like putting my thumb down. And then whatever that song is, is my message. That's my sign. It, it's like a, it's just an easy, tiny little tangible way to make something esoteric real. Mm -hmm. That's Mm -hmm. actually kind of the benefit of doing card readings. I was going to say that's, yeah, that's, 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 that's a tarot reading why we like to do our message from the universe in the format of drawing cards. We could just, we could just ask the universe, what's your message? And then just wait for the sign and try to interpret it. But we use the cards as a way to channel almost or as a, represent as a communication tool yes. between us and the spiritual world. And it can be really helpful because it takes something really intangible. Yeah. And puts images words, descriptors around it. So we, we know how to process it as humans mm-hmm. through our brain. Mm-hmm. 
Um, do you want to talk about, would he be okay with you talking about his experiment? You know what I'm talking about? Your client who's challenging himself in a yeah, physical I way. So. I think this would be a great one. So one of my clients is recognizes that he struggles with discomfort and acting through discomfort. This is a lot of my clients, frankly. It's why a lot of them are working people pleasing course right now. Um, and so one of the ways that he's like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna challenge myself to be more open. Open-minded. Open-minded, open to new experiences, okay. open to possibly putting myself in an uncomfortable situation. Right. Is by trying new foods. And for some of you, you probably love trying new foods. Some of y'all are like, oh, wait, tell me more. Um, I could eat my way through my feelings. No, that's not what we're talking <laughs> I'm about. I'm thinking of my dad. Oh my God. He would happily try any, right. the weirdest food out there. He's like, bring it on. But because that's not uncomfortable for him, that doesn't count. But you know what? Expressing his feelings would be really uncomfortable. Sure. That's a whole other thing. Yeah. So for him, it would be a different test. But for this client, it's been really uncomfortable. He's had some experiences with trying new food and it was, it was gross or you, you it was told me a little bit of the stuff that he tried. And I had to smile because I was like, Oh, he didn't get exposed to a lot of foods when he was younger or I he also just flat out refused to eat that had to relate probably even more than he realized because I also didn't think I liked some really normal foods. Remember when I was yeah, convinced like, I didn't like salmon. Yeah, or guacamole. Right. Could you imagine leave, living the rest <sighs> of your life not eating guacamole I mean, or eggs? You didn't even like yeah, eggs. I didn't like eggs. Like Until there are so did. many ways you could prepare them. There's an infinite number of ways that you could prepare them. And you were just like, that's weird. And I mm -hmm. genuinely don't understand you. Like I never understood that. I was like, what is the worst? The worst case scenario is that you have a yucky taste in your mouth for like 30 seconds. Get over it. But I never I, understood that. I think you would say the same thing about speaking up or having a disagreement or sure. because people pleasing is not the most uncomfortable thing to you or not people pleasing, I should say. No, it's that's not, not your area of no, telling people what I think. Not a problem. Growth. And so, but I again, know what is, I could definitely tell you where I've been holding my 30 second <laughs> blanks. And I might save that for a whole, a whole other episode, episode next month is what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So <laughs> exactly. So for him, that was a really good way of physically putting himself in uncomfortable situations for the purpose of practicing getting out of your comfort zone, not because really, food matters, but because getting out of your comfort zone matters. And so what we came, what we came to as our intention for him doing that was keeping in mind, the point is not, I try the food and do I like it or not? No, that's not, cares? no one that's, cares if you like a, eggs or not. Right. That's a side thing. The point is I want to become more open to new experiences and mm -hmm. I want to feel discomfort and act anyway. And so regardless of whether I like the food or ever want to eat it ever again, yeah. the fact that I tried something I wouldn't have ordinarily tried, that's a success. Yeah. Same with doing the plank. Instead of, did I make it for the whole minute? Or what do my abs look like after a week of doing this? That's not the point. I would the assume point non-existent is... <laughs> after a week, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is how long you're doing those planks, I guess. Uh, the point is not the result. The point is I put myself in an uncomfortable situation and I was fine. Nothing disastrous happened. My worst case scenario did not happen. Mm -hmm. That is where the growth happens. And that's the point of doing it. So when you detach, I need this to happen at the end of me doing the hard thing, detach the outcome from it entirely. That's it's, hard. A, it's a win if you tried it. Sure. Then now it's now it's actually you've you've taken some of the pressure off. Now you can control that. I can control whether I try the food. I can't control if I'm going to like it or not. For sure. But I can control if I try it. I can control if I get down and do the plank. I can't control what's going to happen on the other side or how long I'll be able to go, but I can control the fact that I that I gave it a shot instead of being like, "Oh, I can't do planks." and just never tried one ever again. And if you, if that's the win, you're already set. And you will become a more resilient person. Ugh. I know. I hate resilience. <laughs> <You know? 
<laughs> I hate having to become more resilient. Uh -huh. I feel like there's a question bubbling up that people might be having, which is like, how do you know when it's even worth getting out of your comfort zone or not? Like, when is it just torture or when is it? I don't know. Like, do we, do we, how do we know? That is a good question because I don't think the point is just discomfort for the sake of discomfort indefinitely. Right. Like, my is it, my like, initial how do we thought know it's serving is, a purpose. My initial thought is if you feel that, if you feel that sense of limitation, if you feel that sense of, I know, for example, I know my client was feeling um, kind of trapped in not in, in the discomfort of I can't try new things. So boxed in and like suffocated. Or for example, I'm also thinking, um, I, what would be really uncomfortable for me if I had to go do like an improv class, <laughs> that's uh... about as uncomfortable as I can imagine getting. And personally, I don't care enough about being a really good on the spot public speaker right. for that discomfort to be worth it. I'm not feeling limited in that way. It's not like I have this strong desire to be able to get up on stage and just talk about anything but I, but I'm scared of it. It's like, I don't even have that. To, why would I put myself into an improv situation when I don't even want what's on the other side of that? It would just be discomfort. And then for what it would now I could do it. If I, if I did with the intention of, I want to do hard things and then translate that into other areas of right. life. I want to sure. just challenge myself to do something I said I would never do Sure, because I think that would be like a good experiment for me, but I'd have to have a good enough reason. And being good at speaking on stage is not a good enough reason. I don't care enough. So I'd have to, I'd have to get a better buy-in, frankly, to choose that right. particular or route. Or you would have to have more pain. You would have to be really struggling with your inability to speak up, which you're not to the degree that some people are. Not to the degree that I used to be. Right. So you would have to, yeah, you, you would have to be more motivated because I, things were going worse for you. <laughs> Exactly. Maybe. Exactly. And so more, you needed... more pain or more gain. <laughs> right. So that, that level of, of challenge isn't really necessary when you're not struggling that hard, mm -hmm. maybe, or it's just, yeah, it doesn't, you don't want what's on the other side of it that bad. And I, I mean, for example, mm -hmm. alternative, I, I really, uh, yeah, I think I'm going to talk about this more next month. So just like, hold on to your butts. But, uh, my refusal to date for a long time, which I have talked about in forever alone. Like I've worked through that from every angle you can possibly think through. Uh, I do want, I do want what's on the other side of putting myself out of my comfort zone in terms of like dating. Mm -hmm. And so to me, what I finally decided when a year and a half ago, I decided to, you know, get on the apps, which I never done i never done like the apps i done like match or whatever and then avoided it mostly <laughs> um but i knew i want what's on the other side of that and so it finally became like all right fine i'll just expose myself to this incredible discomfort and oh my god has it been but every but like it's gotten easier and easier and easier i'm doing stuff now in the last like you see, you've seen, you've been there in the last like month alone. How many times have I told you? I, I would cannot never even imagine you would not have done that. <laughs> an old version of Rachel, what she is currently doing. I she know. would be, she would laugh me out of the room. I would like, throw up. I would have thrown up. You wouldn't up. believe me. You'd I be would, like, there, yeah. there's just no way. That's not me. You're talking about someone else. No, that's so. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, but that's a good question of, okay, is it worth getting out of your comfort zone? Okay. Well, well, what do you want on the other side of it? And how much does that thing matter to you? Cause yeah. like, how I much want... pain is it creating for you now? Or yeah. how much limitation is it creating for you now? Right. How boxed in are you by not potentially not doing this? And then how badly do you want what's on the other side of potentially this thing that you could get over? And that helps make it less about the, the specific situation right now. It's not really about, do I share a different opinion and somebody no. gets annoyed. It's not about this it's dude not I'm chatting about, with on Bumble at this it's moment. It's not about this instance. It's about flexing a muscle 
for a greater purpose. Yeah. And that yeah. way, a couple of things happen. First of all, you're more motivated to do the thing because it's there's a there's a bigger why. You're bo- you're more bought in. But also the result doesn't matter quite so much. If it's about this instance and it doesn't work out, it's easier to say, oh, I'll never do that again. And just run right back to your comfort zone. Yeah. But if it's not really about the outcome, it's about I felt myself grow or I felt myself stretch a little bit. And next time will be a little bit easier, and next time will be a little bit easier. Then the result is kind of secondary. Um, I want to share something with you guys that our tarot reader slash uh, intuitive slash astrologist, uh, Madeline Joan, uh, Madeline the Village Witch on Instagram <laughs> and YouTube. Um, she's great. And Patreon. Got to love her on Patreon too. Mm-hmm. She said to me, at some point when I was talking about, I don't know, I guess it was, I guess it was the whole dating thing. And she was just using an analogy and she said something like, listen, if you want $10 million and what you offer up to the universe in exchange is to do the Macarena, (laughs) I'd be surprised if you get 10 bucks. (laughs) (laughs) And it's like, yeah. So Uh what is the weight of what it is you're asking for or that you want. And if you think doing the Macarena is going to be sufficient, like, you know, energetic um, heft for what you, to, to like pay for what you're asking. And again, that I'm not saying the universe expects you to literally pay literally or figuratively pay for what you want, but I do energetic believe, balance. I do. Right. I do believe that if you want something pretty badly, you're not like getting there is not necessarily going to require like a little thimble worth of effort. No, it's going to require a lot of effort. And so you might be trying to cop out with a Macarena level of effort when you might need to devote yourself for an entire year to doing morning pages or right. Like there might Mm -hmm. be a much, much, much bigger devotion that you need to put into something and you're, just trying to get something for nothing, to be mm-hmm. honest. And was that me for a time? Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. It's, I don't know. I don't know. But I do know that I, I think, I think it was a valid call out. It was valid of her to bring it up and to say, to make me consider, okay, well, what is, what's worth then what I say I want? Because if I'm only doing Macarena level effort, I might get Macarena level <laughs> results. <laughs> <laughs> and now about all of macarena. y'all are about to pull that up so on youtube many times and, and yeah. we should all do it today <laughs> <laughs> when i post this as a reel on uh, instagram or something i'll do like a little macarena gif and i'll be like <laughs> if you know you know <laughs> uh, now maybe you have to start with the macarena maybe that's, that's your entry true. point but if you want to just do that once and then get a million dollars i don't know how that's gonna go this is about maybe working your way up, but yeah. consistently showing up and consistently committing to your own growth and your own stretching. Yeah. Because that's where that's where the bigger results happen. Not I did an uncomfortable thing one time. Oh, Not no. I did one plank in my whole life and now I should get nope. all the things I want. Nope. It's a pattern, unfortunately, mm-hmm. of of stretching. That's what, but that's what resilience is. Resilience is being stretchy and you don't get stretchy because you stretched once you get stretchy Mm -hmm. because you did yoga every day for like six months and you got limber. Right. So I don't want you to feel like it's like one big giant act that's now worth what you want. It's more of like, I keep showing up. It's Mm -hmm. more, I prove my commitment. Like Rachel said, maybe it's something like you do morning pages for a little while, or maybe you you stretch and then you stretch again and then you stretch a little bit more and then you yeah. you work your way up. So you can start small, but you can't start small and then end small and then stop. <laughs> and then say, where's my stuff? Why don't I have right. what I want? Right. Yeah. If right. you want to have a great job that you love and you're really fulfilled by, but you've never asked for what you wanted to another human a day in your life, you've never expressed a hard opinion. Um, guess what? Uh, you're doing the Macarena and expecting $10 million. Mm -hmm. And so 
it's totally possible for you to get that job and to enjoy yourself and to feel fulfilled. But you might need to ask yourself, uh, where am I backing off from actually like showing up and getting out of my comfort zone for the express purpose of almost like decalcifying. It's another thing Madeline often uses when she's talking to me is kind of shaking off those like rigid places where you've kind of gone to stone and you've petrified a little bit and limbering up and becoming more, yeah, becoming more stretchy. I feel like you and I are doing that and we're, we're not going to share a lot of details quite yet, but in business, I yeah. feel like we got, we did. Oh, we sure did for a while. We got a little crusty. Uh huh. And then we're like, but why aren't we growing to the degree we should be growing? We've been in business long enough, but that's different than continuing to show up, continuing to stretch ourselves, try things that maybe we're a little post on Instagram, like Instagram, right? Like many other things. Where's my $10 million? I asked you, (laughs) I'm doing a hard thing regularly. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. And it's not a, it's not a one-time effort. It's a, no, it's a, it's a consistent pattern of devotion. uh We're talking about is devotion. Yeah. That's, that's the word that keeps coming up is that devotion is I care more about what I want than the discomfort that I'm currently feeling in, in like having in, in the short term, like I care more long-term about what I want than the short-term discomfort Mm -hmm. that it's going to put me through to get there. Mm Mm-hmm. And so some of you are shirking away from short-term discomfort and, uh, and somehow still expecting to get the long-term result. You don't, I'm sorry. So one of two things is going on. You don't want, really want it that bad. Yeah. Or you, you do, you do, or you're scared, but you're scared of the short-term discomfort. But that discomfort. short-term discomfort feels too big. And that's why we have to work our way up. And that's why you have to practice getting uncomfortable yeah. and recognizing that you survived because otherwise the thing you want is just going to forever feel impossible. Okay. So do you, let me make this more tangible for you guys. Okay. Um, think about a scale of one to 10, 10 being, this would be me at my most, let's say if you're a people pleaser, 10 is I am sharing opinions with people left and right. I can tell something Fully difficult. Expressed. Yeah, I can say something difficult to someone who terrifies me today and feel <laughs> very little, like just feel fine about it for the most part. I um, you know, like I don't shy away from conflict. No, I'm confrontation. I'm leaning into confrontation. I actually think confrontation is productive and is actually brings people closer together, which it does when done properly. Okay. So say that's a 10 if you're a people pleaser and whatever your scale is like my scale would be like a 10 is you tell me, what do you think a 10 is on the dating scale? Um, Yeah. Yeah. On the like out of my comfort zone dating scale. I feel like I've gotten pretty close. You've gotten really close. I would say simultaneously having conversations with multiple men. Oh my God. And you're right. It is. It's that. uh Uh-huh. Uh, and possibly actively dating. Yeah. Multiple. Like, like physically going out on a date with more than one dude in like the span of a week, like the same week. Mm-hmm. Now, honestly, I'm exhausted by that prospect, mm-hmm. but you're right. That's a 10. You don't have to yeah. honestly though. I've gotten close to that. Yeah, you have. Yeah. Okay. But it's, but it's probably a 10. You're right. That's probably a 10. So I'm probably at like an eight. I'm doing pretty good. Mm-hmm. But where was I two years ago? A one and a half. <laughs> She's not wrong. She's definitely not wrong. I give you that extra half. <laughs> you remember that time that our friend tried to set me up with her brother-in-law and it uh-huh. took me a week to even decide if I wanted to say yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. And then I You're did. In a different spot. It took me it took me a week to decide. Today I would be like, okay. Uh-huh. I'll talk to him, I guess. I don't know, show me his picture. Whatever. If he wants to reach out to me, here's my number. Uh. And then to be fair, I did eventually say yes. And I'm so proud of myself. And then he never reached out. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the universe spared me from that, I guess. <laughs> I wasn't ready for it. I don't know. Um, but yeah, okay. So there you go. So there's my scale. Just oh, I'm just getting excited and knocking things over. <laughs> um, so mine's a people poison scale. Okay. And I've I've come. Oh, yeah. What's your 10 right now? My 10 is what you already described, which is I 
Well, where are you in relation to it? For for my version of it, probably about an eight. Yeah, I would say you're pretty close. You're doing pretty well. You've come a long way for sure. You don't care nearly as much about things that you used to care about. No, I really don't. Um, Like you'll say things now that I even won't say. (laughs) But it's because you've practiced more and I don't really need to, right? Right, right, right. yeah. It's like you've gotten better at just, yeah, you'll just... Yeah, yeah. You'll vocalize things that I'm like, it doesn't make me nearly so scared. Yeah. Anymore. It's funny. Um, um, but again, I don't need to say them and you, you feel like you do. Yeah. Sure. So, cause it's good for you to say them, which mm-hmm. is fine, but it mm-hmm. is funny that yeah, you're, you'll say shit. I won't say, <laughs> um, okay. So I want you guys to first identify what your 10 is. Like, what is the thing that feels super duper kind of like outside the comfort zone, really, un- you know, really a stretch, big, big, big ass <laughs> stretch mm-hmm. um, that would probably make you throw up a little at the thought of it mm-hmm. is a good okay indicator. And then where are you in relation to that right now? Like rank yourself. Okay. Let's say, let's say you are me. Uh, two years ago and you're a one and a half. Okay. So your next order of business would be like, what's a three? Maybe even what's a two. Sure. I mean, I like a little bit more of a stretch. I I think a half step is kind of lame, but you know, like you get to decide what's one step higher. And like what some of you are more comfortable with a little bit bigger of a leap. So some of you could go from like a two to a four or even a five, and you could probably imagine what that is. Some of you can't do that. Some of you literally are like, I'm going to have to take it from a one and a half to a two and then a two and a half. And like, <laughs> okay, that's fine. If that's really where you're at, don't cop out on me. If you think you could handle more and you're just being a little bit of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and I promise you, I never, ever call a client a little bitch on the phone, <laughs> but I will call you that on this podcast because I'm not coaching any of you right now. <laughs> okay. And I say that as someone who is happy to call myself a little bitch sometimes when I know I'm copying out, like when I know I'm, I'm shirking my, now, my responsibility to myself. At 1.5 and the very first step you take is to a two. I'm cool with that. Frankly, I'm cool with that because that might, that's the, that's the hardest one. That's the hardest one is taking that first push, getting that momentum going. Now, at some point you might be able to skip a step and kind of push a little bit further and a little bit harder, but I'm cool with you starting out small and working your way up. Um, but if you're more of a Rachel, which we have people call themselves, Oh, I'm more of a Kristen or I'm more of a Rachel. One of my clients <laughs> yesterday said, my new client first call with her said, oh, I'm more of a Kristen, but I really did need you <laughs> to be my coach. Right. So if you're more of a Kristen, okay, you know what? Start on a half step, work your way up to like maybe skipping steps. And then you're really Ooh. flying. If you're more of a Rachel, you might be a little bit more intense in your approach to things. Also go impatient. Go for that three. Yeah. Go for the three. <laughs> <laughs> and that's fine. I'm okay with both. <laughs> But we don't want to, we don't want to aim too high, too far, too fast. Yeah, don't try to jump to an eight. You can't do it. You will literally give yourself hives. Well, and then or throw up you'll, or you nervous will, diarrhea. <laughs> and it's not going to go well. And guess what's going to happen? You're going to go right back to that one and a half. And if you're gonna, not a zero, and, if not a zero. Yeah, you're gonna go and you're going to set down roots there. I'm like, I live here. This is yeah. me now. <laughs> That's not what we want. So jumping too far, too fast. First of all, you're not prepared. So you're not going to approach that in the way it probably needs. Right. Like you're going to go from being able to do a 30 second plank to like a five minute plank. You're going to, you're going to rip something. (laughs) You're not going to, please don't, please don't You're going to fall on your face and smack your nose. Or these are my people, please our clients who they decide I've been people pleasing too long. I'm going to take a stand and they write a response email and it is mean. (laughs) And they're like, they haven't practiced speaking up authentically. So they overcommit and then it's rude or it's and like cold. Nobody would expect that from them. Right. It's yeah. kind of bitchy. Uh, and then it doesn't go well, obviously. And it, then they're like, oh, I guess it doesn't go well when I stand mm-hmm. up for myself. No, it doesn't go well when you try to overshoot and you overcompensate because you're not actually ready for what you're trying to do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so that's why we don't want you to jump to the eight. We want you to see what that is where are we going? What's the version of you who 
once you're really embodied in what you want, what does that even look like? What is that? How's that person's life going? Okay. So, so the question is this then Mm -hmm. to return to the question, Mm -hmm. identify what the next step up genuinely is. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if I were at a one and a half on the dating scale, what do you think a three would have been Kristen? Um, messaging a guy at all. Or maybe even responding to one. How about managing my own dating pro- <laughs> profile instead of expecting you That's to do true. it? That would have been. <laughs> That's it. true. Yeah, I was her online dating filter. I her. just let her do it, and if she saw anyone she really thought I would like, she would tell me, and she never told me anything. But I also was... knew she wouldn't like any of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because I basically was like, only I was like, if they're like a nine or a ten, you know, in terms of which, how many people on the dating profile are clearly a nine or a ten? And I'm just thinking. How do I say this in a way that doesn't reveal anything at this moment? My most recent experience, Kristen, you saw his profile, Mm -hmm. right? If you were managing it, would you have shown him to me? We're talking about... Yes, I know. Okay. Uh, I might have. But it would have been borderline. It would have been borderline. Yeah, it would have been borderline because... Yeah, because I know what you would have said. And what I would have missed out on. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like... The yeah, whole... I'm not. Yeah, I'm actually not sure if I would have because keep in mind his profile was seven. There words. was not. There much... were literally yeah. seven words on right. the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. And he was cute, but it was like, was he cute at every angle? Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, it was like it was borderline. It was borderline for me when I was swiping, and I was like, mm, I'm gonna give this one dude a chance. Mm-hmm. And in hindsight, very glad I did. Mm-hmm. So okay, so that's the so. <laughs> Identify what a tr- what the true next step up actually is. And then to kind of bring it back full circle to the whole point of how we started out, because this actually has become a conversation about how to get out of your comfort zone mm-hmm. and how to do it well, how to actually succeed at getting out of your comfort zone. Consistently. Consistently. Then how can I, how could I practice this before I, before I even attempt to do it? What are some things that I could practice doing if I want to that maybe physically help me practice the discomfort that I'm going to have to exercise when I do that thing? And or how will I deal with the discomfort? So part of this might be a little bit of um, like nervous system regulation. Yeah. When I get uncomfortable, what do I do? Do I just spiral and turn into like a tense little ball on the floor? Or do I go take a walk and try to breathe or... Do right. I do something to regulate the discomfort in my physical body? Right. Maybe so I that meditate. I can move through it more quickly. Maybe I meditate right before I pull up the dating app and then I do two minutes of swiping or I message a dude back and then I shut it down and then I meditate again mm-hmm. for like five minutes. Mm-hmm. Like truly you might need to come up with a game plan for how I'm going to prepare myself for this comfort and then work myself down from the discomfort. Yeah. And also to potentially prepare for how long the discomfort lasts. Because you can control to a degree how long the uncomfortable thing that you're thinking about lasts. Like, okay, I'm going to bring this up at the the last 20 minutes of the meeting with my boss so that I can control that this is only a 20 minute encounter. And I'm not going to schedule anything right afterwards so I can go take a quick walk exactly. and move my body and calm my nerves right. after it's over. And maybe in preparation for saying this hard thing to my boss, Maybe I can say something to my mom, which feels easier than that, but it's still good practice for working up to this hard thing that I have to say to my boss. Yes. Actually, I, for a lot, for a lot of my clients speaking, if, if there are people pleasers speaking up at work, so might good. be, yeah, might be, well, it might be harder because it feels like your money and your, oh yeah. Well, I was going to say vice versa. It can help either way. Right. Like speaking right. up in one place can help. So you if sp- one feels scarier, if maybe speaking up, Uh, with your family or with your spouse feels harder, start at work or vice versa. Maybe start with people who feel really safe and then work up to doing it at work where now it's like money's on the line and survival's on the line and, you know, the nervous system goes haywire. Um, So figure out what your step is. That's what we're saying. It might be the same action, but doing it in a different environment or with a different person makes it a lower step. Sure. Okay. So, So saying the same thing, to my mom might be going from a one to a two saying it to my boss might be going from a seven to an eight. Mm-hmm. That's fine. We start small mm-hmm. and you work your way up incrementally. And I also want you to take a pause after it all happened and take note of how bad was it really? Yes. Because yeah. you can do it 
and feel it and move through it and be like, okay, I did that hard thing and I could do another hard thing. But I also want you to just keep in mind, was it quite as bad as you thought? Because usually it's like, that was not, all, I mean, it was not fun, but like, I didn't die. Nothing really terrible happened. Here I sit, having dated men, real ones. You're alive. Yeah, I'm alive. You're okay. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm me. I'm fine. Uh-huh. Like, I did it. I have done it. I will, unfortunately, keep doing it. <laughs> you kind of put all those experiences in your bank of experiences yeah. to say, I did that, and I did that, and I did that, and I did all these it things. Just, it, and it was okay. It can't. There's no other alternative than it gets easier. It just does. The more you do things that you previously found difficult, the more you build your resilience, your emotional muscle. You're putting yourself through exposure therapy. Where Basically, little by little, you do the thing. Like, this is, um, don't they do this for spiders or snakes or people have fears about lots things? Lots of phobias and I things. I probably need to do that with spiders because, oh, good Lord. Um, no, uh, thanks. But <laughs> is that one worth the outcome? No, not worth definitely it. <laughs> not worth the experience. No. 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 Um, but little by little, essentially, you're telling your nervous system, this is not a big deal. You're habitu- big, yeah, you're because at first it feels like a really, really big deal. You rehabituate and your, your body system. reacts like it's a really, really big deal. And yeah. the more you do it, you're like, it's not that big of a deal. It's okay. It's okay. And then it it takes more and more to get your nervous system quite so worked up. Yeah. So that's why we have to integrate the body. We just and have to. That is why. And again, I think I'm gonna have a whole separate conversation about this next month because I really think I could talk about this as it relates to just me for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> That is why I could not go from like where I was, let's say like three years ago to meeting like a dude who is a 10 out of 10 for me, because what would I have done? Mm -hmm. I would have freaked out. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have been able to handle it. My, you've seen what my nervous system has been like with dudes. I wasn't even sure about it. Just like, I wasn't even thinking about, it was just like, it just triggered me. And the more that I've had exposure and the more that I've had conversations and the more that I've just like learned that, oh, I can trust my discernment. I'm not going to end up in a relationship I don't want to be in. That's at the core of a lot of my fear is getting trapped in a relationship I don't actually want to be in because I've done that multiple times in my history. Um, Not in over a decade, but still my nervous system doesn't remember that it's been a decade. Mm -hmm. Um, The more that I've done that, the more... uh, the more I'm like now, if I met that person, I'd be like, I think I'd be mostly okay. Like I'm, I'm close enough. I'm in the vicinity of it now that it would now get me out of my comfort zone, but in a good way, mm-hmm. not in a, oh, she's having a breakdown, hospitalize her kind of a way. Fully full shutdown. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. Like couldn't do it. Like couldn't have, couldn't have actually like maintained that without literally ending up back at a zero. Unfortunately. Here's the thing. Unless what you want in life is exactly what you have today in this moment, you're already there. You've achieved it all, which is none of us. We always want something different or something new or something yeah. novel. To get there, there's going to be change. There's going to be transition. And that's going to be uncomfortable. So not only is practicing resilience going to be helpful in achieving whatever more short-term goal you have, speaking up more or being a little bit more, more or getting into a happy, healthy relationship, things. blah, blah, blah. But if you ever actually want anything substantial to change in your life, that is inherently incredibly uncomfortable. So you also have to prepare your body and your nervous system for change to get what it wants. Yeah. Oh, I hate that you're right. <laughs> but that is exactly what I've been doing for the last year. Right? Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, uh, it's kind of critical <laughs> unless you're like, I'm good with where I'm at. Status quo is fine. And if you're listening to this podcast, I doubt that's you, frankly. It's, it's not most people. It's not most people. So this is, if, if that, maybe that's the payoff, right? We said you need a big, you need to care enough about going through the process and showing up and being devoted to your growth. Maybe that has to be it. If I really want what I say I want, there's going to have to be some rocky stuff that's going to happen between now and then because it's going to be some changes. Life's going to have to evolve, go through some transitions. 
if I need, if I can, if I want to be able to weather that to actually get what I want, I have to be someone who can handle that roller coaster. So it's worth, it's worth trying the new food or doing the plank or sending the slightly uncomfortable email or in the name of ultimately getting going on a phone date or going on a phone date right? or a real date. <laughs> that's, that's worth it in the name of, I want to be someone who can go through change because that's what I have to do to get what I want. Yeah. So again. I want to know, I want to, <laughs> here's what I want people to comment on if they resonated. You can do this on Instagram or on our blog. Tell me what number you're at on a scale of one to 10. <laughs> what is your $10 million? Yeah. What's your $10 million? And what's your where macarena? Are you? <laughs> right. Where are you? Are you a 1.5? Are you a four? Or are you a six? Um, and then what are you going to do to get one more step? Like, what is the next or step? Or two. What's the like, action I'm going to challenge you to do a little bit okay, more right, than that. Right. If you, if you want to do the Rachel approach, you can skip a step. Yeah. Um, but I, I want, I want this to be tangible. And what might your practice be leading up to that too? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. And for some of you, even sharing that online in some kind of a public forum might be the scary thing. Like I posted this for people to see that was scary. Okay, great. Can't relate, but okay. Mm-hmm. If that scares you, that's fine. Mm-hmm. Some of you can't relate to my fears and that's, it's totally valid. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. Well, I didn't know what we were going to really talk about, but it, it yeah. turned out to be okay. Like usual. Yeah. I didn't know where that was going to go, but I feel like we landed in a good spot. <laughs> My podcasting used to be pretty scary to you. And now it's really now not. Now it's totally neutral. Yeah. The first three times we podcasted, I would be like sweaty, nervous and kind of sweaty. Cause I'm like, there's a microphone and I don't like public speaking. And you're like, it's not public speaking. Cause there's no one here. And I'm like, yeah, but there will be people and they're going to hear it. And now I just talk. <laughs> Exposure therapy over what has it been? Three four plus years. years. Four years. She still can't remember the oh, anniversary, man. you guys. No. It was only two months ago, <laughs> but I reminded her it had been four years. She doesn't remember it's a lot that. of podcasting. Okay, so report back on your homework, mm-hmm. and um, I guess we will be back next. Mm, I think we're. Mm, what? I think it's a message. It'll be a message from the universe. It will. Yeah. I just wasn't sure I was right about that, but I am. Oh, mm-hmm. wow. Okay. Well, come back next Friday to see what the universe has to say to you. Okay. We'll see you then. Bye.